welcome, welcome to Global Citizen Now, where we convene around ideas for urgent impact. And in turn, we're going to use those ideas to generate some action, all right? Somebody say action. Action. And we need that action because we have to make sure everyone's basic needs are met, that our planet is flourishing, and frankly, every person in every country can prosper. So welcome. I'm excited to kick this off for you all. Okay, Hugh, I'm, I'm going to start with you because uh, you're the boss and we like to start with the boss. And this is the third year right now of the Global Citizen Now Summit. What do you hope the outcome is of the next two days? And tell folks why this particular gathering is different. Well, firstly, thank you so much, Simone, for being part of Global Citizen Now, and thank you to all of you for being here and part of the movement. Really, the thing that makes Global Citizen Now so unique is that we're driving urgent action to tackle the world's greatest challenges and end extreme poverty within our lifetime. And so every single panel that you'll see over the next few days is tied to a specific call to action. Most summits you go to a lot of words, and they're wonderful words, but we need to actually drive real action to create change at this urgent time for the planet. And so over the next few days, the other thing that makes this interaction so different is when you go to the UN General Assembly, or if you might go to Davos, they're often closed door meetings. All the, all the conversation happens behind closed doors, whereas you can see at Global Citizen, we're bringing together business leaders, we're bringing together political leaders, we're bringing together artists and advocates, and most importantly, citizens, representing our 12 million members all around the world. So over the next few days, I'm really hoping we can achieve three big things. Firstly, we really need a breakthrough for the planet, and so we're focusing on supporting the Amazon rainforest. We have, obviously, Anita, who's with us, as well as representatives of the Brazilian government, because we're working in partnership in the lead up to the COP gathering next year to try to secure an additional billion dollars from philanthropy and from business to help reforest the Amazon. The second goal we're focused on is investment in Africa, because we know right now that many of the G20 nations are not keeping their promises, and now is the moment to double down and keep their promises to ensure that the 75 of the world's poorest nations have access to cheap or free lines of credit so they can ultimately be debt-free and not shackled by the burdens of debt that often hold people back. And thirdly, we really need to make sure that those people who are in the midst of, of conflict and crisis around the world, we're seeing it in Ukraine, we're seeing it in Gaza, we're seeing it in South Sudan, in Yemen, all around the world, and it's mostly children who are victims. And so we're trying to raise $600 million to support Education Cannot Wait so that every child in conflict and crisis zone does not miss out on a year of quality education. If we achieve those things, then I'll leave the next few days and the next few months like we've, as a movement, made a positive step forward in a very complex world. Ooh, oh, we can clap for that. I mean, it's a tall order. We've got two days in a good room and some great panels. I'm confident we can get it done. Uh, uh, Fran, look, I was just at the bureau before I came here, and it is hard to escape bad news, uh, just daunting headlines these days. Let's build off what Hugh just said. Where can folks find some, some optimism, particularly young people? I uh, was just talking to Jane Rosenthal a few minutes ago, and we were talking about storytelling and the amazing stories that are out there and how so many people as we make the time to get a little bit curious and spend time, I think we learn stories about resilience. We learn stories about heroism, action. I think the first thing that I would say for all of us is just to take the time to listen to those stories because they fuel us. They, they create a level of energy. The other thing that I would say is that I do think we have to learn, all of us, to uh, not get too tied up in some of the acronyms mm. that are out there today that have become so political. And so I think about ESG, I think about DEI. What I realize is that if we can move from the acronym and double click on what the work is trying to do for the world, for people, for communities, I think we find that there's so much that we have in common. And the last thing that I would say is, as I think about tonight, 
Um, we are going to see young people that have done amazing things around the world. It shows the power of what one person can do. And I think it also demonstrates the accountability that we have when we see that one person to do everything that we can to help them be successful and thrive. Mm. Yes, yes. Look, young people are not the future. I think we are the right now as a millennial. I'm holding it down for the millennials. And the Gen Zs are even doing better than we are. Mr. Prime Minister, can we, you know, when we talk about buzzwords, I often think about the term climate change or climate crisis. And especially in the news media, people throw those words around. But I, I think we need to drill down. Uh, talk about extreme weather. Um, they are really becoming the norm in 2024. In 2017, the world watched in horror as Hurricane Irma destroyed Antigua and Barbuda. C can you just talk about the importance of global collaboration, both when it comes to response, but also when it comes to prevention? And i just like to tell everybody that the Prime Minister is also a farmer, okay? So an actual <laughs> farmer. So we can clap for the farmers. So, so he is someone that is close to this issue in many ways. Thank you very much. Uh, I am indeed a farmer, making sure I make my contribution to food security. Uh, having said that, the issue of climate is the most significant existential threat facing all of humanity. And whereas I've been asked to speak about the situation in Barbuda, we have to recognize that practically every country on the planet is actually suffering from these climate events. In fact, we're literally destroying the earth. And it requires collaboration by all, by all stakeholders, by policy makers, by um, businessmen, businesswomen, uh, philanthropists to come together to fight this uh, climate crisis. I recall back in 2017 when our sister island Barbuda was decimated by Hurricane Irma, it was like a mangled wreck. In fact, at that time, we wondered um, precisely uh, what would we do? I mean, whether or not um, the island would be habitable in the future. It was actually deemed to be inhabitable at the time to the extent that we had to vacate all of the residents of Barbuda to a sister island, Antigua. And that was certainly one of the most um, powerful storms that we would have seen. In fact, since then, we have seen many more storms. They're more ferocious. Uh, they are certainly uh, more impacting. And they're more frequent. And as a consequence, uh, small island states globally are suffering. In fact, their civilization is now imperiled. But again, as I said, it's not limited to small island states. Uh, most countries have, co have coastal communities, and uh, those coastal communities are also under threat. So this requires a collective action of all of humanity to address this most significant existential threat that is facing all of humanity. We only have a single planet. We don't have a planet B. And therefore, all of us, each of us, must be committed to addressing this issue by ensuring that we reduce emissions, by holding the large polluters accountable, they must understand that they cannot continue to put profits over the planet. We have to protect our planet in the interest of all civilization, in uh, ensuring that we preserve our common humanity. And therefore, I want to certainly commend uh, Global Citizen Now for bringing us together as stakeholders as we address this most significant threat facing all of humanity and our planet. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, you know, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that the effects of extreme climate events, like the Prime Minister just referenced, they, they disproportionately affect women and girls. And Fran, to that point, lifting up women and girls is something that Cisco has been committed to for well over 25 years, um, especially through bridging the educational divide. Can you just talk a little bit about the Cisco Network Academy and the impact that that is having across the world? Yeah, I'm really happy to. I, I think we all realize that digital skills are so critical. Skills, education are so critical for all of us. I think the thing that's changed from a private sector perspective is there's this realization that talent comes to you with so many different paths. I think that's new. Um, at Cisco, we have trained 20 million students over the last 25 years. And when I think about- I'm sorry, hold on. People just broke, breeze past the number. What was the number? It was 20 million. 20 million. We offer this training for free. 
Um, it's something that we want to make available. I think right now we're hearing so much around the world around AI and cybersecurity. What I need to let you know is that unfortunately, women and underrepresented minorities are not represented in this new and incredibly exciting path. And we have to work so hard to change this. If I look at the continent of Africa right now from a cybersecurity perspective, only 9% of the workers in this space are women. We have to change that. The, the most amazing thing about this opportunity is that these technologies are, are just starting from an AI perspective, even from a security perspective. And so we have an opportunity right now to double down on education, which we're doing. From a Cisco perspective, we're committed to training another 20 million people over the next 10 years. We want to do a ton more in cybersecurity and AI, and we want to make sure that we make it available for all. Let's stay on the continent. Um, we can clap. You, do not be afraid to clap. I like an engaged audience. We are trying to start off strong here at Global Citizen now. I like it. They're awake, Hugh. That means they're with us. You know, I, let's stay on the continent, because Denai, you took to the, the Global Citizen stage in Accra in 2022. And can you just talk a little bit about the challenges rooted in what folks refer to as a legacy of colonialism that countries like those in Africa and, frankly, in the Caribbean face? Uh, sure, yeah. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, it's actually become more and more clear to me that uh, we are so far from uprooting ourselves from colonialism and the legacy that is still very much in place. I'm Zimbabwean, by the way, of American, born in Iowa, but grew up in Zimbabwe. Shout out to Zimbabwe the Midwest. We Shout out to the Midwest. To the, the Nebraskans in the room. First gen, but African raised. Uh, and definitely grew up in Africa, grew up in, in Zimbabwe right after its independence, right into its various stages. And really the realization looking at things from the macro level is that we are still under systems of neocolonialism. Like it just shifted like from the slave trade to colonialism, to colonization, to neocolonization. And there's many things that are at play. There's uh, the fact that it has really often been said, it's being said more and more blatantly lately, that really the reliance of the Western world and, and often the Far East as well on is on our raw materials, our raw resources, and keeping them, keeping their stability as first world forces, so-called, is in, it's intrinsic that we remain impoverished. So there's a very specific balance going on between how the so-called first world works with the third world. I mean, Jacques Chirac said in 2010, basically, France would be a third world power if we're not for Africa. And there are ways that they still rely, Francophone nations are relied upon by France to maintain its first world status. So that is across the continent. If you look at even how, who's in control of a lot of our, our natural resources, I mean, we're ridiculously wealthy from the, the, the coltan to the cobalt to the lithium to the diamonds to the rubber to the oil. I mean, we can go on all day, but often you don't see us in control of it. Now we also have a leadership issue, okay? This is complex, it's not just one-sided. And the leadership issue is also very much, um, you know, a part of how people, places like, you know, the United States, for instance, it has destabilizes nations to keep certain, certain leaders in power, to keep things destabilized in their favor. This has been going on for decades. So how do we get to the end of it? Well, the realization that the fact that it's not, there's no, the simple solution isn't about only saying, hey, West, give more to Africa. It's also about really dismantling a structure that works intrinsically against Africa being self-determined and being able to take care of itself, which it is more than capable of doing. It's giving leadership matters. If I can switch back to climate for a moment and talk about your leadership, Mr. Prime Minister, um, you have actually been calling on nations to get serious about the fight to phase out fossil fuels. What message do you have for fellow leaders who continue to drag their feet on this issue? And, and what do you say to those folks that say, mm, it's just a little too ambitious? Well, it is quintessential that all leaders globally commit themselves to reducing emissions and certainly to phase out the use of uh, fossil fuels. To do otherwise, obviously, is to imperil the planet and all of human civilization. 
So my simple message is for the leaders to show greater commitment and to certainly um, adopt new technologies to increase the transition into renewables, at the same time to ensure that we do not exceed the 1.5 degree threshold, because we all know that um, if that 1.5 degree threshold is actually exceeded, then evidently it could be catastrophic for a number of states, including small states. But I also believe too that um, leaders globally uh, need to uh, show some level of climate responsibility. I'm also of the view too that uh, voters need to hold their leaders responsible uh, because ultimately you're the ones who will determine their success. I mean, many leaders are obviously captured by uh, certain organizations, especially the fossil fuel organizations, their lobbyists and so on, and um, they need to liberate themselves and they need to understand they have a responsibility to all of humanity. They have a responsibility to preserve and protect the planet and um, ultimately it will be the people, the voters, who will have to keep them responsible to make sure that they commit themselves to phase out the use of fossil fuels, not to be going to COP after COP after COP after COP every year after every year, making these pledges and at the same time without any real commitment to achieving the reduction in, emission, in emissions. So in essence, they've been gaming the system, and I'm of the view too that other than holding them responsible with the vote, uh, perhaps too, that um, small island states in particular and developing countries globally, like-minded countries, uh, should consider legal options. In fact, Antigua and Barbuda and Tuvalu would have um, uh, put a, uh, an advisory question or to get a legal advice as to whether or not um, these um, large polluters, if they are literally violating the um, unclosed um, treaty, and similarly, uh, Vanuatu would have gone to the ICJ to make that determination. I believe that these are the actions that are also needed to complement the voluntary pledges that have been made, many of which have not been satisfied. Uh, ultimately, as I said before, we only have a single planet. There's no planet B, and we have to hold the policymakers responsible, and we also have to help them to liberate themselves from the organizational capture to force them to be committed so that they can address this issue, this most significant existential threat facing all of humanity, and also to ensure that there is no further displacement of poor and vulnerable individuals, and so that all of us could achieve resilient prosperity. Did I, you also have a call to action. Um, you are launching an action campaign on the Global Citizen app, and that relates to the protection of women and girls in conflict zones like Darfur. Can you tell us how this audience here, not just in the room, but on the Zooms, as I like to say, can support? Yeah, well, I have to start by giving some context. Uh, when we say the, the actual call to action is around conflict-related sexual violence. And I think it's something that shockingly is talked about much less than, less than it should be. It's actually extremely urgent and astoundingly dire. We just saw the UN report about this come out, which is showing that the issue is actually increasing. It's not decreasing, which means that when there's a conflict, when there's war, when there's any type of thing like that, it's almost like the, the, a, a, a rule of, of, of combat for there to be wretchedly horrific atrocities committed upon the bodies of women, girls, and children. To the point where we're, we're talking about atrocities that are almost unthinkable, that are happening systemically across various countries across the globe. The focus that uh, I have as an African connects to Darfur, connects to Sudan, where about exactly almost a year ago, Unfortunately, a new conflict began. We've heard from the UN, it's, it's, it's also connected to one of the worst, possibly worst human famine issues we've ever seen. And, women, and everyone's left, everyone's gone. So you basically have no protections for the women and the girls and the children. Uh, so right now we have to remember that that sort of an issue, I could go into the stories, there's so many, and this call to action will reveal those stories to people because people have to understand these are girls and women who had hopes and aspirations and dreams that are being ripped away from them, families being broken apart. It's like you can't think about, oh, I'm going to just go to the store today or walk across the street or wake up and feel safe in my home. We're talking about 12-year-olds who, um, Niamat Ahmadi, who's an amazing woman from Darfur, who runs the Darfur Women's Action Group, who you will learn about in this call to action. She tells the story of a 12-year-old girl who was gang raped, and her parents had to decide between feeding her younger sibling or 
taking her for treatment. And she just looked at her mother and said, I just don't want to live. That should never be a situation a child should ever have to face. And we're looking at the fact that two big issues that we have to push for. We've seen it done before. We saw it happen 20 years ago with the Darfur Now movement. It can be done when you can push as a collective, as a global citizen collective, for difference, for change, for policies, for acknowledgement. A lot of this stuff is happening in the dark. When it happens in the dark, it doesn't get dealt with. And so the, one of the biggest issues we face, one of the things that we want to push in this campaign, is the fact that impunity must end. There is this basically a default concept that you can rape a child, you can rape a woman, you can walk into that home, do whatever you want. In Ethiopia, there's, there, there are, uh, this is a horrifying trend of tying girls to trees and raping them publicly and leaving them there. You can do that and nothing will be done to you. There is nothing in place to hold those men accountable. That is unacceptable as, a citizen, as citizens of this world. And we can stand up and, and push against this sort of action being the default action against the leaders. There are leaders who won't even acknowledge the issue. There are some who've acknowledged it, but they, have, they, don't, they haven't implemented the systems of justice. There are ways that people just get away with it. That needs to be addressed. Also, the disarmament issue. The fact that over the course of the last nine years, we've seen uh, m military spending go up to 2.4 trillion, spending on actually dealing with this issue, supporting women and girls, taking care of them, protecting them, and, and preventing this was at 150 million. That's 0.01%. That, and the more that you look at it in Darfur, in, in Haiti, in, um, in, in the DRC, wherever you look, Ethiopia, all of the perpetrators are armed to the teeth. So the more weaponry, the more the violence against women and girls. That is something that must be held to account. The embargoes are constantly being completely ignored, violated. We have to push leaders. We have to push the, um, the, uh, the people accountable to account. And that's what this will do. The beauty of Global Citizen is that it can bring a lot of attention to a topic that is not getting attention across a great swath of humans like yourselves and various others. So please do check out when we have it live, which will be very shortly, you'll be able to hear this amazing woman, uh, um, uh, Amadi, speak to the UN um, Council, which I spoke to also last week. You'll hear her words. You'll hear the words of a woman who's been on the ground, who's been through a genocide, and who's telling us what we can do. And we'll have actable ways for you to be a part, because we can make this stop, and it's, it's, it's up to us.